It's not fair. Every time we go out, it's this shit. The whole thing is a pack of lies. No, but that man, Pete, he said he met this man who said he was... Oh, he said, she said, they said. They're always saying something. But do you want to know the truth? Do you know what it really is, AIDS? It's a racket. It's a money-making scheme for drugs companies. Do you seriously think there's an illness that only kills gay men? It can calculate that you're gay and kill you, but no one else. Hmm. So what about bisexuals? Do they only get sick every other day? And they say it's a cancer, but you can't catch cancer. Cancer is not a thing that can get caught. It's not like a cold or a cough, it's cancer. It doesn't transmit. Because imagine it, gay cancer. How is a cancer gay? I mean, what does it look like? Is it pink? Where is it? Is it in the wrist? I mean, for God's sake. You get all these stories and all these rumors and all these nightmares, because that's what they want you to think, that lot. They want to scare us and stop us having sex and make us really boring, basically because they can't get laid. That's the truth. Because according to them, how does it work, this AIDS thing? OK. They say it's spread by poppers. They say it arrived from outer space on a comet. And they say that God created it to strike us dead. They say it was created in a laboratory to kill us. They say it's the Russians. They say we got it from the jungle. They say it's caused by friction. <laughs> they say it's in the spunk. They say Freddie Laker spread it when he introduced cheap flights. They say there's one patient zero spreading it wherever he goes. <laughs> they say it affects homosexuals, patients and haemophiliacs. Like, there's a disease which has targeted the letter H. Who's it going to get next? People from Hartlepool and Hampshire and Hull. Don't you see what all of these things have got in common? They're not true! And how do I know? How do I know it's not true? Because I'm not stupid! Which means... Hello, everybody. Welcome to this BFI at home discussion presented in association with Channel 4 and BFI Flair with the cast and creatives behind one of the most hotly anticipated shows for 2021, Russell T. Davis's It's a Sin. Um, and uh, I'm glad to say we don't have to wait too long uh, for It's a Sin because it's going to be transmitted on Channel 4 here in the UK this month. So uh, later on, we'll be meeting some of the actors from the show. But first, I am truly thrilled to welcome to our wonderful panel, the writer and executive producer of It's a Sin, Russell T. Davis. Hello. Hello. Uh, we'd also like to welcome the executive producer, Nicholas Schindler. Hi. Uh, uh, the director, Peter Hoare. And uh, hi, Peter and the Channel 4 Head of Drama, Caroline Hollick. Hello there, and welcome to you all. And as we're lucky enough to have so many of you with us today, I'm gonna to start by talking to the creatives first and then move on to bring in the cast uh, later just to make the discussion over Zoom a little more manageable. So Russell, if I can uh, start with you, um, firstly, congratulations on a, a fantastic uh, an amazing series. I think it's absolutely up there with your very best work, if not, if it's not your very best. Um, why do you think that now is the right time to tell this story? I, mean, I don't know. I don't think there is a now to this one because um, there's been all sorts of, I've been able to wear being part of a body of work here. There's been many great pieces of work about, I mean, I think specifically, I think there hasn't been a British AIDS, HIV and AIDS drama, specifically about this ever. It's featured as a plot in other dramas. But um, over the years, you know, we've had things like a couple of years ago, obviously The Inheritance by Matthew Lopez mm -hmm. in, in the West End, which is an American story, but it's brilliant. It's like, I think it's a story that it's, there is no now to it. It bears telling again and again and again. In 10 years, oh, we're all here looking at some brand new take on the same era. It, 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 there were so many stories. I could have written a hundred episodes about this. So it's simply a powerful story. The, the world happens to have caught up with us in terms of viruses, but um, that's a very strange thing. It's very strange to listen to Radio 2 and hear people talking about the one great virus of their lifetimes. You see, they go, no, two. There's been two, 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 two. Mm. Those strange days, aren't they? And how did you, how did you benefit from 
having the distance compared to those people who were making this, well, say this kind of shows, but shows on this theme uh, when the, the, the virus was yeah. more present in the 80s and 90s. I suppose it, yeah, it just took me a while and I got the perspective. I mean, you know, one of the very first pieces ever written about it was The Normal Heart, which is the most brilliant, ferocious piece of work. Was that written in 1985 or something? It was like, as it was happening. So, you know, it, I mean, it's full of fury, that thing. I don't think as a result, I don't think it's a sin is full of fury. It's angry, but that's not its its first emotion, I think. So, yeah, I had to, you know, I, I sort of grew up and, and learned enough tricks and learned how to write a bit, so to come and face it properly. But um, be interested to look at what I'd write about it in 20 years' time. And I think our perspective, our, all of us, gay men, as, as a society, our perspective on what happened in those years is always changing. Hopefully, it's always broadening and deepening. Is, is there an element of wanting to warn today's younger generation not to be complacent about HIV? That's absolutely a thing. It's like the world would still be better if, if, if an awful lot of people, more people got tested. The numbers of people walking around untested with HIV is frightening. We do tend to talk as though it's over just because there's medication. Mm -hmm. and, you know, there is apparently a younger generation growing up, some of a younger generation, thinking that it's fine because they can get medicine. So you don't want to be on medicine. If you're gonna have a life without medicine, that's a better life than one on medicine. So, you know, for all the, um, the antiretrovirals, and all the advances in PrEP, it's not something you want to get. And, you know, the UN has a, an amazing initiative now to um, eradicate HIV by the year 2030, to eradicate it. And that's a fine aim. Well, who knows, maybe the follow-up to this series at some point is writing about what's happening now with yeah. PrEP and this uh, sort of complacency. But um, looking at it's a sin, looking at the characters, I mean, this, this might be a, an obvious take on it, but when I look at the character of Colin, you know, who's written with such sensitivity and insight, I suppose I'm curious to ask, is that, do you think that's the character that's closest to you? And did you use generally with all the characters did you use autobiographical elements in in the in the characters and the plot it's a lot of yeah a lot of it is based on myself and people i know and stories of people i knew stories that built up the decades i mean colin's welsh so it's obviously but actually he was he was um he was someone i went out with in the 90s who trained to be a tailor and went to new york to to fit lords and ladies who lived in new york with their with their suits and gowns so actually that was based on someone else and then called john Beautiful man. Um, so you just grab bits and, or, from all over the place. It's a bit like when Queer as Folk came out and everyone said, oh, were you Vince? Because Vince was the nice one. Mm. Uh, I'm much more like Stuart, really. I'm horrible. I'm a horrible person. So <laughs> it's, I, 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 I love I, the fact you're not saying I'm like Richie because he's the sexy one. Why am I like Richie? Matt? Maybe you are to some. Thank you. To some. Thank you. <laughs> well, be careful. People are listening in. But... Uh, you 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 did use autobiographical elements in the plot as well. Everywhere it's like when I was eighteen. This this series fits my life literally. I was eighteen in in nineteen eighty one. I went to university. That's, that's my, a lot of my friends went to live in London. All my gay friends all went and lived, and they moved into a big flat in Hampstead, I think it was, and they called it the Pink Palace. Um, so this is quite literally a lot of, a lot of the dialogue. It's got their jokes and their rhythms and stuff like that to it. So um, there'll be a few, there'll be a few friends I haven't seen for years who'll be watching it going, this is slightly familiar. <laughs> I lived in Paris once. Um, so, and some of them, of course, are no longer with us. Some of them passed away because HIV came along and claimed a lot of their lives. So um, it's nice to pay testament. It's nice to remember them like this. I'm very lucky in my job that I can do this. Well, well, you, you know, one of the ways your story has been so brilliantly realised is thanks to the remarkable performances throughout the piece. And I, I want to bring in Nicola now, uh, because uh, th this really is a phenomenal cast. And uh, both you and Russell, can you, can you tell us about them and um, what it was like working with them? And, and, and how, did the, how was the casting process? Um, we work with a brilliant casting director called Andy Pryor, who makes it all very straightforward yeah. because he understands Russell's work and he understands drama very well. And he put in front of us these fantastic actors, some of whom we knew, some of whom we didn't. And, and it, it just became relatively straightforward to see 
these brilliant young actors become the characters, understand them so well, bring this life and vitality to the work, which is what we were looking for. It was, you know, it, it was the group of people we ended up with are the perfect cast because they have an energy about them, which Russell's work needs. They have a speed about them. They're always eager, looking forward. You know, it, it's not a, it's not an indulgent piece, even though it's about something really serious. This is a group of actors who can carry comedy as well as tragedy. And also then they just gelled so brilliantly. I'm sure they'll tell you, but from the outside looking in, they just seem like such a great group of friends off screen and it's translated on screen as well, which I think is the magic that obviously Peter really helped with that. But it's the magic that you want to capture when you're telling a story about friends over a number of years. And a coup also to get Neil Patrick Harris uh, in the show. How did that come about? We literally asked him and, and he said yes. It was one of those. <laughs> I think, you know, we talked about it and um, we knew that he had done a lot of work for AIDS activism and that it was something that he was passionate about. But then we happened to get him at the right time when he'd been looking at British drama and wanted to be involved in British drama and, and you know, enjoyed the challenge, I think, of playing British. So, yeah, we were very lucky. Now, there'll be a lot of younger viewers that aren't, as we've sort of discussed, that familiar with this particular part of the 80s. Is there anything you'd, Nicola, that you'd like them to take away from it? Well, I mean, I, there's a lot that I wasn't aware of as well. I'm so much younger than Russell. <laughs> <laughs> not that really but just because that wasn't my world so uh, the, you know when I when I remember AIDS when the iceberg advert that we've got in an episode came on screen and there were posters everywhere with icebergs on and you know I think for people to look at that period and understand I think what, what Russell's writing made me understand for the first time is it's not the end result which is the tragedy it's the lives beforehand so it's just the joy of these young kids who were 18 19 you know who had everything to live for who just wanted fun and this awful like event not event this awful virus happened to them and happened to lots of their friends and families and i think when you see it from that point of view, when what Russell's done is made sure that we understand the characters first and, and love them first before this, this impacts on them. And I think that's really key for a, a younger audience. Do you, do you think, I mean, and the answer to this might be no, but are there any parallels you could draw between what happened during the AIDS epidemic of the 80s and the current pandemic we're living through? Well, I get, I mean, yes, in that, you know, in that there are restrictions on people's lives. But I think other than that, it's, it's, everything was so different because, because I mean, Russell would say this better than me, but this is a, a pandemic that affects everyone, including non-gay, non-minority um, groups. Therefore, it's become, you know, the, the impact of it and the response is so much bigger. It took so many years. It, AIDS was ignored for so many years and was purposefully ignored by every country around the world because they couldn't face it, whereas this has been tackled head on. So other than the fact that it happens to be a virus. I think you still get people being marginalised now. There are still niche groups. There's still, it's, still, it's still the old rich white people in charge. And, and even now, I think you could see the same patterns uh, recurring of... of the home county is being protected and if you're in a, on a minimum wage uh, or no wage at all you've had it and it's the same process of marginalization weirdly hmm. yes yeah, so, the, so there are some parallels i, I want to bring in peter hoare the uh, director hi peter hi. um now the 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 drama has a breathless energy and forward drive uh, was this something you very much wanted to pick up on and develop particularly in the visual look of the show and the, the sort of fast-paced way that it's edited? Well, that's Russell, really. I mean, he doesn't hang about. <laughs> um, and, and I love that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a test for us all when it comes to the schedule because there's a lot to do. But, but you, you re I read episode one and I was enwrapped and entranced and everything and laughed and cried. But it was full. It was dense. There's a lot of stuff, and 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 you just know when it's that vibrant and that busy that you will get a better result. Russell started from a position of of, of breathlessness. It was fast. It was furious. He didn't want to draw anything out. He wanted to meet. We had a lot of characters as well. We had you know the three main, but also everything else. Their worlds. There was a lot in it. It's very very uh, a busy script. So um, it just felt to just sort of get into line with it, really. Just just keep it motivated at all times. And it's and and we added music. Russell had already written musical cues in, but we we went a bit further. Myself and Sarah Brewer and the editor, and and just punctuated it even more to keep 
could keep that momentum going really I, I thought it was I thought I, I really liked the, the speed and pace of it because to me it was almost a nod to the fact that to get uh, HIV you got AIDS fairly quickly and you died fairly quickly and people had to squeeze lots of things into their life I mean years ago I played Lee Bowery on stage and it was extraordinary how much he did in such a, such a short space of time, knowing that he only had this short space of time. Uh, and also, um, you know, people had to move very quickly, as they are doing now with this pandemic, uh, to try and find treatment medicine that will, will help uh, uh, with, with uh, you know, the health situation. And so I, I, I remember things just moving very quickly then anyway, um, because there was not much time. Yeah, I and mean, also we, we touch on in this series the, the, the lies of the gossip, the misinformation, um, you know, and, and you were asking about parallels. I mean, that's obviously quite key, the people that won't believe the truths, the, or they don't know the truths. I think back in the 80s, there was so little real information around, and people were searching it, they were chasing it, and there was an, obviously the American stories coming out first, then over, uh, over to us. And, and then the rest of the world. But, you know, it was just like, what was true, what was wrong? It was, it was a similar situation where not quite as perhaps as disingenuous as now, but, but, but also, you know, you, they just didn't know what, what was going on. And we have characters that won't believe it. We have characters that want more information, um, but that maelstrom of, of, of all that emotion going on, as well as being young and fit and health, well, you know, healthy and wanting to have a life. So, and that's another thing that Russell said, it's like, you know, they'll have a moment and they'll think about something dark but the next minute, right, let's go out, let's go and have fun. It's that quicker turnaround in their heads. Mm. And, and sometimes when I was putting that together with that pacing, it was like, have I done enough here? Have I made enough of that moment? But that's not the point. Life is going on. Let's, let's fill it. Let's, let's meet all those men out there. Let's meet, let's have that much fun. Let's do all of these things because there's this specter looming over all of us and we'll either confront it or we won't, but we might as well fill pack our, our days and 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 yeah the, the the series is very much like that and and until you know till perhaps the end but well it's and it's a great it's a great credit to all of you involved that the show does sort of shift uh, so markedly in tone uh, several times during an episode but you know you go from high camp and humor to something mm. really deep and sad but 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 it works it absolutely works and and uh, I'm sure you will pay a tribute to the actors uh, for making that happen. Absolutely. I mean, I, I came on slightly late to the production and, and, and casting was already in place. And, uh, you know, there's always that thing about, well, if you don't like anybody, and, and, and firstly, I would never do that. But I, I, I met them all and it was just a, a, a triumph to, to meet them all. And, and as I mentioned, Andy Pryor, who's just a genius. And, and it was so much more than just a cast or a casting. It was just like... There were so many other things going on that I think he had already spotted and I was discovering as I, as I met them, as I worked with them and we had a week's rehearsal and, uh, and I, was I was getting excited about taking them out for, for a, a vegan uh, dinner. And by that point, they'd already had about three trips out and, and, and three, you know, a, a drinks night here and whatever. And I was like, oh, oh okay, right, fine. So you, you're all best friends. Great, thank you. Yeah, they come, they come across uh, like a family. Um, oh, so, uh, so close. It was, it was lovely to be part of that in that first week. And obviously throughout the entire process. I, I want to uh, bring in Caroline Hollick now, who's the head of drama at Channel 4. Hi, Caroline. Um, Hi. Now, this series was greenlit before you joined the channel, but from your perspective, what do you think makes Russell's dramas, you know, Queer as Folk, Banana, uh, uh, Cucumber, it, It's a Sin, quintessentially Channel 4 shows? What's in their, their DNA that is the perfect fit for the channel? Well, a Channel 4 drama always shines a light on who we are today. Um, I think it always has to be in some way revelatory. It has to say something new. Um, and our remit means that you know, we're always looking to tell stories from marginalised voices, people who've been silenced. And Russell's the absolute master at all of those things. I think it's no accident that we're still talking about Queer as Folk 20 years on, um, as if it was on, you know, the other day. So, you know, it's been a huge privilege for me, particularly, I worked at Red for many years um, with Nicola, Nicola and Russell. So to be able to come and work with him at Channel 4 on a show that, summed up everything that I want to be able to achieve with Channel 4 drama has been really, really amazing. And the thing with It's a Sin is that, although it's a period show, um, 
it has he has such a unique perspective and I think that's again the thing that makes a Channel 4 drummer really stand out it's a very fresh voice um, and he's kept that freshness throughout you know the, the, his, his extraordinary career um, and he just changes the way he allows people to change the way they look at things I don't think I think that as the first drama about the HIV pandemic the first British drama about this I think it will be hugely revelatory to a lot of people particularly younger audiences but I think there's also a universality in the way that he writes that means that there's a hugely broad appeal I think his reflection of what it's like to be LGBTQ you know and young and embarking on life's adventures is unlike anybody else but that universality sort of breaks that it's not just channel four he never writes in a kind of niche way you know russell storytelling goes across well, across borders we co-produced with hbo max for example who are just as excited and thrilled by the storytelling and feel that it's going to land with their american audience as much as we're excited about how it's going to land with channel four so i think what russell does that's unlike anybody else is manages to be unique and absolutely laser focused in what he wants to say very political but also have this universality of characters that we can all recognize and um and delight in and it's really funny and channel four is always at its best when it's being funny so we're really lucky i feel like russell sort of russell and channel four are intertwined you know and have been for for two decades so yeah it's a sin absolutely sums up all of those ambitions well thank you thank you so much caroline um and thank you to Nicola and Peter. Um, uh, we'll hear from you again uh, in a little bit. Russell's going to stay with us. And now it's time to welcome the amazing cast. So we'll start with uh, uh, Keely Hawes. Uh, we have Ollie Alexander here with us as well. Oh, we can see Ollie. We can see <laughs> Keely. Hello there. Hello. We have, uh, so Keely plays Valerie. Ollie plays Richie. We have Amari Douglas, who plays Roscoe. Hello there. Now that was slick. This is like <laughs> Celebrity Squares. We have Callum Scott Howells, who plays Colin. Hi, Callum. Uh, you are muted at the moment. There you go. Hello, hello. Hello there. We have Lydia West, who plays Jill. Hi. Hi there. And we have, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we have Nathaniel Curtis, who plays Ash. Hi, Nathaniel. Hello. Hi there. Okay, so we'll, we'll just start with uh, Ollie. Um, uh, I know you've said, Ollie, or I believe you've said that Russell helped to shape you as a gay man from watching Queer as Folk when you were 14. So uh, if that's true, or even if that isn't true, tell us <laughs> what it means to you to be part of this production. Gosh, well, I remember being 14 years old and watching Queer as Folk with my friend at her house in secret in her upstairs bedroom away from her parents. And I remember being so scandalised because I'd never seen men on television touching each other before or with their clothes off and it was it was very scandalous to me at that time <laughs> and it left a mark on me ever since um I wasn't till later till I revisited Queer as Folk um and I felt like it had such an important part in kind of shaping me as a as a gay guy and and the culture and the, the community I've grown up in Any, anyway so I heard Russell was making a, a show and I was I just wanted to be involved. I mean, I didn't need to hear anything else. And then when I read the script and the story, I was so moved by it. And I think, yeah, it's one of the coolest things ever. And I also, the first thing I asked Russell was, why did you, you know, call your show Years and Years? Because, you know, I'm in a band called Years and Years. And Russell, you know, he's, he obviously he was a fan. So that was, that, was, that was another nice thing. So I felt like there was a poetic, like, justice to it or something. It was, it was amazing. Very lucky. And uh, I mean, you've always campaigned in your music career for LGBTQ plus equality to be recognized and accepted. What are your hopes for the series being seen by today's younger generation? Oh, well, I, I really think, you know, a story has the power to really change the way you feel about something, you know, that's how I've really come to understand a lot of, you know, this era is through amazing works of fiction and, and, sto and the stories, you know, and I think Russell, this story is so moving and I hope people are moved by it. And um, I think that kind of leads people a little bit more to more understanding. So I hope, I hope that's what happens. And, and, and you're, known, you're known globally for your music with Years and Years. 
but not not everybody knows you for your acting but they they will do after this because it it really is a remarkable performance i mean it's 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 i'm just i'm moved just thinking about it now and it, and it, and all the performances it just stayed with me for days and days and days um since since working on the show is acting something that you plan to spend more time on or, or are you just going to sort of wait till the right project comes along because you've obviously been quite spoiled here i know well Thank you for being so nice about me. <laughs> I, um, um, I, I, uh, that was very sweet. I think, you know, it's gonna be very hard to top this experience because like you say, it, it was a real dream come true. The, the, everybody that you, that's here that was in front of the camera are just amazing people behind the camera were amazing people. So it would have to be something really, really good. But I do want to play someone with magic powers. So I, I definitely, I'm open to, being like a sexy gay witch or something. <laughs> Russell, <laughs> Russell, off you go. Sexy yeah, gay witch. <laughs> Thank you, Ollie. Um, Thank you. Let me ask uh, uh, Keely. Keely, you play Ollie's mother, Valerie, and at times she's complicated and a conflicted character. What was what was it like taking on that role? She is. She is. Um, she is complicated, but at the straight time, at, 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 at the same time, she's she's incredibly straightforward you know she she is what she is she's a woman of her time she's a product of her generation i wish Honestly, tell your mom don't get ideas now i'm not safe as soon as you get there you bring that law back fast as you can i'll have a word good boy well, it's not the lord bloody chancellor he's going to study the law not make it well give him time no definition of a barrister is a servant of the law he's leaving home to buckle down and work hard that's the point oh, i meant to say I'll go through your wardrobe next week. There's stuff in there from when you were 12. You know, I, I, was, I was sent the scripts. Actually, I saw, the pre I read the press release about this show and I said to my husband, oh my God, I'd love to be in that. <laughs> so I literally, even without having received the scripts, I would have been going, okay, I booked myself onto the 329 to Manchester, where would you like me? Um, so I, I, I read the scripts and, well, I read the first four um, and uh, Valerie is, um, her, her story comes to fruition really in, in, in episode five, which, which makes it a little bit tricky, tricky to talk about because I don't want to ruin it for everybody. But um, Valerie is, is somebody who is, is, is very easy to, to dislike, really, I think. Um, and so the, the trick was, um, you know, bringing something likeable to her because we have to have empathy with her and I I do I mean I, I knew women like that you know I I, I knew people like that um, and so uh, you know at, at, at her core she loves she adores her her children and and her son you know in in her heart she she adores him um, but it is I, I have to also flag up it, it is it has become apparent that I can't talk about the show without crying. Really don't. <laughs> oh no. I really I've been doing interviews. I've been doing that, and I've and I mean I can't I can't talk about the cast and how gorgeous and generous they were to me. I can't I can't talk about the characters. They you know as you say you you just you carry them uh, with you. Um, they they don't leave you, and that is down to the cast and down to their performances and down to Russell's writing, um, and the fact that this is a. Um, in a, 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 a Russell production and, and Nicola and that magical com combination um, and the fact that it was such a joy, just a, a joy um, to, to, to walk onto that set and be welcomed like Sean, the wonderful Sean Dooley and I were. Um, we were so grateful for that um, and the, 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 the wonderful material and these guys who um, you know, as 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 you say, it just translates their relationships uh, on on screen um, and off screen. You know, it, it it just translates, and they are all just magic. Well, it's Sorry. what you <laughs> what you do in the in, isn't it? <laughs> it is brilliant. But you 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 really convey the sense of helplessness of of, of the character so beautifully, and I think. I think, uh, yeah, again, I just think it's it's a towering performance, and um, you know, I'm excited. I'm excited for other people to see it because then I can talk about it with them. You know, I am, I am too, and it is, you know, as yeah. I said, very very hard to talk about uh, Valerie in too much detail because you know, to, she, she's in the she's in the final episode, and I, and I wouldn't I wouldn't want to spoil it, but I mm. uh, I can't wait for everyone to get a load of these guys um, because they they are just off off the scale.
Well, thank you. Thank you, Keely. Now I'm going to uh, move on to Callum now. Callum Scott Howells, who plays uh, Colin. Uh, hello. Hello there. So you, you got to work extensively in the opening episode, in particular with the great Neil Patrick Harris as Mr. Cochran. So tell us what that was like. Um, it was it was just amazing. Uh, honestly, Neil is just like he's a magician. Like he really is. He's 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 a wizard. Like what he can do is just something like I'll, I don't think I'll ever get over. And it's something I'll remember for the rest of my life. Like I remember the first day on set, and like I know Pete, Peter like remembers this too because we we talked about it like later on when we were filming and just like seeing how Neil works, like and how he how that's home for him like being on a set and playing characters is something that I'll never forget like that first moment being on set with him and he was so generous like so nice to me and and I felt like he made it so easy then to like because obviously like the way the relationship is he made it so easy to play because I was constantly just in awe of him so yeah that, you know he's amazing he's absolutely amazing yeah now you have, I, uh, how can I say this? You have an enthusiasm uh, that's a bit like uh, Colin's. It was very good, very good casting. What, I mean, what aspects of Colin did you most identify with? I think, I think the, the sort of naivety of him, I think, the, the whole thing about sort of learning everything as, as, as you see it, like, I, I think that's something that really sort of, transcends in B like when like because I remember going to London for the first time when I was young it was to see a show you know and and like it, for me like it, it's all it's, it's that it's just I totally Russell is just amazing at what he does and, and he made it so easy to play like it, it's just yeah for me for me it was all that kind of that kind of stuff I just I just loved it I loved it Matt it was lovely oh. to meet you too it's lovely oh. to meet you Yes, thank you. Well, listen, uh, uh, thank you, Callum. I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, chat with Lydia now. Um, Lydia West, who plays Jill. Hello there. Um, Hi. I, I, um, you're the mother of the show. You really are. And the warmth that you bring to that character, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's beautiful. And, and your character is based on a real person. Uh, that mm -hmm. was Jill Nalda, is that how, how it's pronounced? Uh, oh. Yeah. Um, and 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 so how did you how did you approach that? Uh, did you have an opportunity to talk to to Jill, who who appears in the show actually? Uh, how did you did you have an opportunity to talk to her before before you started filming? Uh, I did. So Russell told me the day before the read through uh, that uh, the real real life well Jill is based very loosely um, on a real life character called Jill and um, so much so that he didn't change her name and um, she'll be playing my mother and I was like ah! oh my gosh <laughs> so I arrived at the read through and I'm kind of like just reading all my lines and looking over it doing like odd glances at Jill just wondering if I said that <laughs> correctly and uh, I went up to her at the, I approached her at the end of the read through and I was just like thank you so much for being, for being you and she was just like, oh, stop it. Um, and and she she's just very lovely and so kind. And I didn't I didn't make any of my character choices based on her, but it was just amazing to have someone in the room that lived through this time. And she is how Jill is depicted. That that is the real life Jill. She's kind, she's generous, she's very sweet. Um, and every time I see her and spend time with her, I learn so much. She's so, so interesting and so inspiring. Um, so yeah, I managed to have have some conversations with her about the era, and about her friends and about the Pink Palace. Um, but she, I didn't want to. She didn't want me to. And Russell didn't want me to base any of my kind of character choices on her, which was which was so nice because um, it, it just gave me the complete freedom to play Jill um, as as I did, and not kind of try and uh, mimic um, certain certain traits of of the real life Jill. Um, not that that would be an issue because she is spectacular. Well, you do bring you do bring a a, a, a a female intuition and and warmth to the show. Did you? Is there a pressure uh, in playing the perfect friend for these lads? I mean, did you find yourself looking after them on set, just as your character looked after them? 
I, I think I did, but I think that's just because of my nature. I'm quite nurturing and maternal. <laughs> but I, but I, I didn't see my mum when I was watching the show. Could you, <laughs> could you help me with all my problems? Please? I absolutely will. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I it, there was um, I think just as much pressure as, as as any other kind of role. You you kind of want to do the best that you can do, and be as as honest and as, as faithful to the character it, as possible. Um, Jill is beautiful and perfect and so great in so many ways, but she also is very nuanced and she goes through things that a lot of young people don't have to go through. And she, she, she's there's certain beats in 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 the script and in in, in the story there where she has to make life changing decisions and she doesn't always do it with ease. It's just she does it from a place of love and care for these amazing friends that she has, um, and she's she's very human. So as much as she is an angel. Um, and I, I think the real life Jill, Jill was once describing this to me as well, that, she, that um, she's, she's still very human and she doesn't, she would, she, she does things from a place of love the same way a lot of people would for people they care about. Um, and obviously, yeah, she faced a lot of, of, of adversity too. Um, and fundamentally her values and morals are just amazing and incredible, but yeah, she's very human. And I, I, I tried to play her in a way that was relatable in that sense that, yeah. Well, it's it's you did such a beautiful job. Um, uh, 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 Amari Douglas plays, Hello. and he's such a fun and lively and warm character. Um, now we see in the first episode that Roscoe's family is very religious, and that his family's beliefs conflict. I mean, violently with how Roscoe wants to live his life. I mean, do you think the character of Roscoe offers some hope? and encouragement to those who may still live in similar circumstance today? I, I hope so. Um, I mean, you know, I wouldn't want to kind of generalise and say that everyone could do what Roscoe did, because I think, you know, it was that, you know, in episode one, I think it's quite a unique situation in that Roscoe is brave enough to do what he does and, and, and take himself out of that environment. Um, you know, he's he's brave enough to do that. And of course, you know, not everyone has the the opportunity or is is able to do that. But I think what there is kind of encouragement in is the fact that like he is someone who manages to find his tribe and he finds a group of people who um accept him and and uh you know it's it's a space for him to be able to express himself in the way that he does. Um because I think what's so amazing about all of the characters is that uh, is that there's kind of like a spectrum or like such a variety in the way that they do <laughs> are discovering their sexuality or kind of expressing it. And I think with Roscoe, there's such a like boldness and uh, and a kind of flair about him, which was which was just so amazing to embody. So, you know, for someone to be able to express themselves in that way, you know, it's kind of important that they do find a space where that is fine. And Roscoe does find that. So, yeah. He certainly does. What in the name of the Lord? I'm going now. So thank you very much. And if you need to forward any mail, I'll be staying at 23 Piss Off Avenue, London, W. Fuck. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs> Did you enjoy working with Stephen Fry so closely? <laughs> oh my God, completely. He's like, again, like just, just, just like all of the people in the show, like he's just such a fascinating man and insanely intelligent and it, I was just kind of bowled over by just how um he, he's just like this amazing presence I was just constantly in awe of him um and he's so fun and yeah I just just love love being around him and listening to again he's someone who has such an extensive knowledge of of, of the time and he he told me some really harrowing stories and he's 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 really inspiring you know so yeah that was that was something that I didn't expect to, to to have, but it was just like such a gift. Well, those, those more scenes, that knowledge from him. Those scenes are spectacular. I mean, they are just they're brilliant. I don't want to give them away, but they are they're amongst my favourite scenes in the show. Um, let me let me chat uh, to Nathaniel uh, Nathaniel Curtis, who plays Ash. Hi, Nathaniel. Hello. Hello. Hi there. Now it's as soon as your it's your TV debut, I believe. It is. Yes. Well, <laughs> oh, it's not a bad way to start. So no, no. Um, Russell 
Russell always writes young characters so well. They're full of passion and energy. I mean, what was it like bringing Ash to life? I think, okay, so when, when I first read the, the script, when I read the first episode, the one thing that really got me was how relatable all the characters are and how relatable their relationships are. I could see in just within the first couple of scenes that their friendships are the kind of friendships that I have with my really close friends now, with my chosen family. And it's just being able to, to kind of tap into that so easily because the writing is so gorgeous mm. and it's so just relate, like I said, relatable. It was, it was such an, it was just such a joy. It was just fun. And like with, with when we were on set, it wasn't because we all do get, we all do get it on very, very well. It wasn't hard to bring out those relationships with a people that you love and be with beautiful, beautiful writing. And it was just, it was just an honor to be honest. I know that probably sounds quite sycophantic, but it was just a real honor to be able to be entrusted with that actually, to be entrusted with the stories. Well, you also have a scene with Ollie, which I'm not going to give away quite early on, where something happens that I've never, ever, ever seen represented on screen before. It's, and I was, I was watching it thinking, I must tell my mum to watch this show. She's, she's more open-minded <laughs> than she was. And I should come to find with you next time. And then that was the moment where I went, oh, not 100% sure. I'm <laughs> tell my mum to watch this particular episode but um i'm not going to give anything away but i think you know what i'm talking about yeah ash certainly enters with a bang i think he does enter <laughs> with a bang. now uh, it's time for us to move on so let's bring back nicola peter and caroline for this i have a i have a, a quick question for for the cast it was what was it like immersing yourself in the 80s with the music and the wardrobe and did you try and keep any of the clothes? Because they're pretty spectacular. So much fun. Uh, so much fun. <laughs> it was so fun. I think what I was... Kept... Oh, sorry. Go on. No, no, you go on, thanks. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, um, Ian Fulcher, who was our costume designer, was incredible. And I actually remember going to the first fitting and he kind of, because the show spans over 10 years, um, the, you could see the journey, like, in the character, like, through through the wardrobe like kind of not only kind of because of time passing but also you could kind of see it because of what was happening to the characters as well mm -hmm. um and, and and yeah that that was amazing and then in terms of music like I'm still immersing myself in it now actually I've been watching like reruns of Top of the Pops on iPlayer from like 1980 <laughs> <laughs> which is amazing it's just anyone, the best. Get to, anyone get to half inch any of the clothes you managed no. to oh. I tried to, but then at the, by the end, every item of mohair that I was wearing was really itchy because it wasn't lined inside. <laughs> so I'd end up just being like, oh my gosh, this is so itchy. And, um, and then by the end, I was like, no more mohair. But now this winter, I'm like, mohair? Yeah, it's come my way. <laughs> does, does accidentally wearing a pair of socks on count? I, one day I wore a pair of socks. Um, but I guess that's not. You've got to give just... those back, Callum. Have you? I'll send them back now. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? I mean, this is this is a, a, a I guess a heavier question. But what 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 do you think the legacy of the AIDS crisis in the eighties is for us today? I mean, Russell, you may you may have thoughts on this. I and mean, what what have we learned from it? And and have we become better people through a deeper understanding of it? Um, I think I think it's I think part of the problem is it's still ongoing. I think I'm always very wary about talking about it in the past tense. Um, as I was saying before, there's still an awful lot of people who should get tested, and still an awful lot of prejudice. My friend trying to adopt uh, two children recently. He's HIV positive. Three times they brought that up in court, and it's, it, that's illegal. It's nothing to do with the status as a parent, mm. nothing to do with his role in, in adoption whatsoever. Three times the social workers kept on bringing it up and the lawyers were literally saying, stop it, stop it, stop it. And they wouldn't. So, you know, you, you can't say it's, it's a problem. And indeed, you know, in terms of, um, you know, what Peter was saying, in terms of like false facts and, and the information, the, the ridiculous information that was running right in the 80s is still running right now. In fact, fueled even more by the internet. So many, many things haven't changed. I think there's a great argument to say that it's a unifying force in many ways. And I wish I wish it was a longer series. I wish it was 
20 episodes long because you, you I never got to pay tribute to like many of those nursing staff were lesbians that, that when some staff wouldn't touch eight patients it was the lesbian staff who'd step forward and say we do those late nights we do those extra shifts that's slightly in there but I could have written a whole episode about that um so that unification is is a wonderful thing and those charities are still out there I'm lucky enough to be patron of the Manchester uh, H, uh George House Trust um and believe me there's still a lot of work to be done but yeah it's 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 in, you know, now you look at the, the time when HIV could could possibly be eradicated. You think, wow, we lived through we lived through that. That was that was our moment in history. It's 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 how strange is that? Well, um, it, it, this is. I mean, I've, I, I've said it before, but this is a, a really uh, beautiful tribute to uh, the people that lived through and died in the uh, the AIDS crisis here in the UK and and there is a, a lot more to discuss but we're we're going to leave it there today um uh, thank you for giving us your time uh, congratulations on such a fantastic series and uh you can see it's a sin on January in the UK um on channel 4 um, so uh, thank you very much for uh, taking part in this discussion and um, a huge thanks to Channel 4 and BFI Flair for putting this discussion together. Uh, if you're watching it after the event and you've enjoyed it, then just a reminder that the BFI is a charity organisation. So if you'd like to donate, then the details will follow on the screen. Um, but uh, for now, I am Matt Lucas and uh, don't forget to watch It's a Sin. And this has been BFI at Home. Take care and thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. Lots of love.